And now I would like to invite Pia Moilanen to the stage. Are you ready, Pia? And can you unmute yourself too, please? <laughs> Unmuting yes. was the problem. Hello, here I am. And now <laughs> Great. Also the screen. Yes. Great now. to have you. Great to have you. And, and I'm you. really looking forward to hearing your talk. I know uh you know we've been talking a lot with you and we're working a lot with like this public procurement and making helping uh, organizations to make more innovative choices and think about what the impact for the private sector is but i think that not so many people maybe have thought about things from that perspective so i think yeah. that is going to be interesting so pia moilanen from business finland is going to lead us to that question go away oh no go away take it away <laughs> yeah sorry <laughs> Thank you. okay Thanks a lot. Uh, so um, I come from Business Finland, which is a government-owned organization um, for innovations, uh, trade, travel, and in investments here in Finland. <clears throat> we also fund uh, with few millions every year public procurement, and that's why, or innovative public procurement, and that's why I'm like here. I also work for Keino, which is a competence center for innovative and and sustainable procurements here in Finland. And um, my topic is how public innovative procurement speeds up API and platform-based R&D in private sector. And um, I warn you, uh, this won't be too technical. Uh, and also because I thought that the procurements might be a bit dry subject, I choose a case study. So we go this topic to this Digi1 case. Digi1 is a, a joint platform a reform for education sector here in Finland. The project was uh, or started 2018. At those days, the city of Wanta um, looked at the Turku castle and they saw that it's an old castle. It has uh, towers and walls and whatever and didn't really work as uh, it should. So they understood that uh, the old system needed to be removed and changed. And they understood that the platform solutions could really bring benefit for teaching. So they made a bold project plan and started to seek funding. And 2019 funding was granted for the project. And that's why I'm also here because Business Finland uh, was granting the funds for the project. So we fund this 11 million project with around um, 6 million euros. Uh, the goal for the project is to improve learning and well-being by changing the way educational services are produced and delivered here in Finland. And this will be done by building up an open ecosystem and a service and innovation platform for education few words about the educational market. It's good to know a bit background. Um, it's huge. Uh, or globally, it's over 6,000 billion every year that is used. However, uh, the degree of digitalization is very low. Uh, the edtech, which means these digital services, uh, this sector segment within this um, this market is anyway growing very fast and, and even faster now because of COVID-19. And the big role, uh, or the public sector has big role here. Uh, and around the world, governments do have already invest or have invested in, in uh, new technologies, but mostly by putting more hardware in classrooms. Also di digitizing existing learning resources and the uh, actually, the schools have been pretty happy with that because they have been able to pick up what they need, need and, and what they want. However, the problem is that the, this hasn't resulted very much for learning. So the learning results haven't raised. And the same problem with, uh, with the scaling or cost efficiency. They haven't gained really cost efficiency either. 
so something must be done and and certainly there is potential and we thought that in finland we have quite good possibilities in succeeding because we have very high quality public school system and we have also skilled teachers and the public sector is already pretty digitized Digi1 have operational, ecosystem and technological objectives. From the operational objectives, uh, I would like to point out that um, data is in the very center here. So uh, with the data, uh, they can start uh, delivering more individual learning solutions and paths. And this is uh, expected to, to result better learning outcomes. They are also hoping to, to be able to do much more knowledge management. The ecosystem objectives uh, pretty much focus on, on scaling up. So they need to scale up so that uh, at least majority of the municipalities here in Finland want to join the platform. But also the companies need to want to join in. That's the objective. And then the technological objectives, they need to serve these two purposes. So, um, of course, they want to exploit the potential of new technologies. But it, to do that, and in, in the beginning, what has been a, even a bit kind of surprise for them that they had to invest really a lot and they are still investing a lot in, in creating rules and standards for the game. Otherwise, they cannot start building up these platforms and, and pieces of this platform system. Uh, then why are we actually here? And why, for example, Business Finland wanted to invest uh, our funds to this project? I think it's pretty, pretty clear for us already that um, the reason is data. So. APIs and platforms enable and boost the creation of data and the availability of data, for example. And innovation then is increasingly data-based. And with innovations, we can stimulate new economic activity and growth. So that's obvious. But of course, then also the public sector needs to understand that with the data, they can deliver better services and, and also gain cost efficiency. Uh, perhaps another surprise for uh, Digi1 has been that uh, the management model for the system um, and designing the management model has uh, called uh, more effort than what was thought in the bef beforehand. So at the moment, there are already six other cities that have joined uh, the development of Digi1 uh, platform an ecosystem and the goal is that by 2028 there will be already about 70 municipalities using the service so they have pretty fast pace here and after the project and and because the the platform must scale up so fast they have made a collaboration agreement with so-called Kunti and Tierra company which is a municipal in-house company and that means that uh, these um, municipalities uh, uh, are the owner of this company, so they are shareholders of this in-house company, and that's why they can buy the services uh, from this company, or they can join the platform without tendering. And that makes it easy for them to enter to the platform. Another thing, of course, when thinking about this organizational model, is that um, uh, they have to think the scaling so that the uh, usage fees won't be too high. And that also might mean that uh, there needs to be a lot of users here. Uh, another aspect are, for example, that there must be, or the model must support motivation uh, and the financial model to further develop the platform so uh, that it can stay up to date. They have to look beyond the project funding. And that's why they, of course, need to have scenarios for longer term, like 
what's the need for the services in long uh, long term and and uh, what are the financing possibilities in digi one case it was clear uh, and it was a clear message from municipalities that the ownership needs to be predictable and trustworthy they said like no for uh, private sector ownership for the platform this may be case uh, in other sectors as well but not perhaps always but this must be thought carefully also well uh, however the uh, services modules components in the platform they are produced by the companies so uh, they have to carefully think what is the necessary um, what are the necessary parts or modules that the uh, public sector need to own and what can be like owned by by the uh, companies and also uh, how to create a functioning market around the platform and that's why digimon also uh, has been investing a lot in ecosystem creation in order to create a functioning market and here I would say that um, they have identified, of course, all the parties and they have invested a lot on discussion with the, these different parties. And in the long run, the data is also important uh, added value for the ecosystem. So with the data, they can really um, keep the ecosystem living. And I think that uh, outside this sticky one, these ecosystems should more uh, welcome public sector into this ecosystem because as big buyers, they could really bring added value for the ecosystem. They can open up markets or produce references or help scaling new solutions. And also these public sectors, should of course, seek, seek entrance because within these ecosystems they can keep up the market understanding which is a problem for many of them digi1 has a procurement policy they have uh, uh, like three categories of procurements and uh, the core are so-called digi1 services uh, which are the same for all all uh, municipalities so so they cannot choose any other service, they have to use these. There are only a few of these kinds of uh, services, and here Digi1 wants to keep the IPRs. However, also these are mainly developed with open source. Then they have so-called Digi1 influenced commercial services. I will show from this slide. They are here like in the middle. And from here, uh, in the long run, there will be several choices for municipalities or these um, educational service providers what to choose from there and digi1 doesn't want to keep the iprs here and the majority and the biggest portion of course are these commercial services where digi1 will only set up like criteria what kind of services are allowed to join or how they are allowed to join the platform so it may include like uh, criteria for uh, cybersecurity or ethical issues or of course the uh, API interface here and then there are many ways to boost innovation and I think Digi1 has pretty much uh, or will uh, pretty much um, succeed uh, and fulfill all these criteria or uh, ways of boosting innovations with their procurements this, most straightforward way, and I think most people, what they think here is that they boost innovations within the procurement. So they set up so high standards or they call for such criteria that, that doesn't exist yet in the market. So there needs to be done R&D in order to fulfill these criteria. And this will, of course, be done here too. Uh, but another way is to help scaling up the innovations. So, for example, if a small uh, company has made an interesting educational technology solution, they would like to start selling 
to the municipalities. They can, uh, with these kind of platforms, instead of one customer, they can find at once uh, uh, 70, for example, because uh, they don't have to integrate to different systems 70 times. And that helps scaling up the innovations. And that's important for small tech companies and makes the platform interesting. Another way, of course, is that they can enhance uh, systemic, uh, systemic chains by setting these standards. Like if they start uh, asking, for example, for a very high level of cybersecurity in, the, in these, these services. But what I think that has the biggest potential is, is by enhancing the possibilities for innovation with the data. So, for example, DigiOne will build up uh, a sandbox where there will be uh, educational data and these companies joining the platform can start using the data to develop better services. And that's, of course, I think here will be the biggest chances to enhance innovations. But uh, we all know that th there are challenges. The procurements don't and are not always very easy. And um, especially uh, tech companies find, or small and agile tech companies might, and, and find uh, public procurement uh, very um, heavy and, and difficult. Uh, I interviewed you uh, years ago, um, 21 growth AI companies here in Finland. And I found out that when talking about innovative public procure or procurements, they said that uh, they are just too slow. The pace is so slow that they prefer looking for private sector markets. And another issue that they raised up was that there were uh, skill gaps. The know-how wasn't uh, high enough. They, from these tender documents, they saw that the procure really didn't know what they were asking. And then they understood that there is no possibility to succeed. And that's why perhaps they didn't, didn't uh, join the, this process. And they also so, uh, told me that, no, they don't like to engage in market dialogues. And that's a bad news for public sector because market dialogues are the main way of uh, uh, increasing market understanding. But the good news, of course, is that the companies said that, yes, actually, innovative public procurements, they are interesting and they have interesting challenges there. So the process is the problem, not the challenges or the market itself. So that should be fixable. And of course, there's a good reason to be interested. And it's this huge sum of money that is every year used in, in public procurement. Uh, at the European level, it's over 2,000 billion every year. And that's a huge sum of money. The bad news is that a very small portion out of that is used for innovative public procurements. I think that the good news for this audience is that a pretty big portion out of this small portion of innovative public procurements is anyway linked to new technologies. So it's pretty often it's we are talking about digitizing uh, existing services, for example. And of course, the good news is that uh, by raising the amount of innovative public procurements, uh, by 1%, we could really boost uh, customer-based R&D with huge sum of money. And governments around the Europe are doing this. For example, Finnish government has set up a goal to increase this amount up to 10%. So 10% of public procurement should be innovated in a few years' time, and that's ambitious. So uh, a takeaway from my presentation, it's uh, scaling. The scaling should be kept in mind. And I think it's that um, the procurers should think about economies of scale. 
they should think how to gain cost efficiency for the services for the public sector. And so they also need, and this is linked, that they have to think how this, for example, platform can scale up the customer base, how they can get more customers using it. And that means that they have to think about the scalable business and organizational model as well. Who will be the one who owns and is motivated to scale and, and build up this, this system? And then they have to think about the scalability of these commercial components and microservices there. Because if the companies don't find it scalable, it will be heavy and expensive for the public sector. Thank you. Hope you have learned something. And at least I was happy to share my thoughts with you. And in case you get interested in Digi1, you can check their web pages. They have also English ones. Thank you. Thank you, Pia. It was an excellent uh, presentation, and I'm so glad you you uh, said yes when <laughs> I asked you to come, uh, because I think that this is very important. We have a lot of uh, public sector uh, audience, uh, people in audience, and we have also private sector from, from various companies. So um, there are some questions for you in the chat so we'll start with those and i have some questions of my own too <laughs> but okay. let's take uh first one so uh if data is important and leading to innovation and growth then how does one homogenize data privacy rules and regulations taking an example of schools in finland a lot of finnish students maybe all of them transact a lot with their own data on platforms that are not under the purview of Euro European Union rules and regulations on data privacy. So how does one tackle this reality? Mm. Yes, <laughs> I started with heavy stuff, <laughs> sorry. It's a tricky one. Um, of course, the municipalities here, they are thinking uh, firstly the data that they have and how that data can be then uh, used and and how it can be harmonized and how they can work with the data with uh, in accordance with all the regulation and what i think that might happen is that uh, then of course there may be commercial uh, companies that uh, start um, start uh, offering services directly for example for students and they made uh, agreements about the data without like uh, asking any permission from the yeah. government or municipality or school. And then if this public sector is not agile, this might become, you know, like a more important way of, of using the data. And then I think it might also happen that this will be uh, bad news for public school system because private schools might start using the data more um, agile and faster, and they could uh, bring services faster for the students. Mm. But so, for the international audience out there, so in Finland, we have like the main uh, mm -hmm. school system is the public system. So that we have some private schools which are kind of operating under the uh, guidance of of the public sector, but but still with own own funding or mostly own funding. But yeah, I think that I, I was I was dealing with the Digi One guys in the very beginning when they're planning planning some of the basic models and and architecture. And I think that one of the issues there was 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 brought uh, to the attention that the students and the teachers will actually use these tools, whether <laughs> whether the system. <laughs> Is supporting that or not or not and, yeah yeah and and you're kind of like having to deal with this bring your own device issues and and all kinds of other aspects of, of um, teachers and students being more agile than the system anyway and so there is a an added uh, problem of like whose data it is and how to deal with the data and I, I was I was also um, discussing with the Helsinki City education department about this because they had a an issue of, of um, dealing with for example researchers 
that were coming to the schools and, and wanting to make research. And then you had this kind of situation where you had to figure out whose data and how to give permissions from the children and the children's parents to use that data. But definitely from an authentication point of view, for example, in Digi1, there was this discussion about uh, the, the caretakers, the adults, the parents coming in and the students coming in that, and the teachers and the school faculties coming in and everybody needing to be kind of aware of whose data is being used and give permissions on that. Mm. Hey, we have uh, another question here. So. Uh, from Janne, so there are a lot of excellent edge tech companies in Finland already selling their services abroad. Are you collaborating with those on Digi1 platform to reach new markets? Mm. But what I know, for example, is that Digi1 is uh, at the moment, uh, they are preparing uh, an international event for summer. So they are looking for companies, not only Finnish companies, but also companies outside Finland to join the platform. Mm. And, and to start uh, delivering services to and, and through this platform. So they are looking for these um, and many companies <laughs> and Finnish and also companies abroad. Yeah. It's just that it isn't like so ready yet that they cannot, the companies that would like to join the Digi1 platform, they cannot deliver their services yet. It will mm. be, uh, 2023, uh, I guess I remember, call, uh, or recall it right, that the platform will start uh, function with these pilot customers. And and of course there is the always when public sector is 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 planning something this this size and this big and this type of uh, service, then there is that problem of is public sector coming to compete with the private sector yeah. Uh, but yeah so if you want to comment that mm -hmm. yeah the idea here is not to step in so the there are many uh, uh, modules and platforms that could be integrated into digi1 they are like creating the integration uh, platform and w where they kind of step in is these core services which they want to create mm -hmm. And then, of course, the municipalities, then they can choose also if they want to join the Digi1 platform or not. So it has to be so uh, as good as possible. And what we have been also thinking is like that, of course, it may happen that in the long run, there will be a commercial platform and it will be better than Digi1. And then perhaps it's not useful anymore. But at the moment, that didn't happen uh, with uh, without interfering from the public sector side. It was uh, like that there was no um, common rule, so they couldn't um, bring in such model that the municipalities would have liked to join in and start creating these common rules for the game. So it was kind of necessary at the moment. And I think that the, the issue with Digi1 is actually that they were so innovative that, that it kind of, uh, there, there was a lot of things to invent. There was the architecture, but there was the, mm -hmm. the kind of the business model, the operating model, everything. But but usually, like you said, there is this kind of, uh, well, lack of skills or lack of innovation. And I think that the, the projects that we have been uh, working on uh, together with you, for example, have proven that a lot of times, uh, maybe public sector thinks that the innovativeness of the procurement needs to be in the technical side, mm. but actually, a lot of a lot more times it needs to be on the business side in the in the how the services are delivered what are the ways to do the same thing as we've done before like in traffic sector in in building and construction public management i, I think we've seen all of those cases where actually if they think in a new way how the how they are working how their co customers how the citizens are dealing with them and the companies are dealing with them, then it actually helps to understand what is mm -hmm. the architecture there and especially what role APIs and maybe some integrations or platforms are playing in that. So I think that the work that is happening here is really important. I, I want you all in the audience to kind of take this away from this uh, talk that 
yes, there is a need. There is money in innovation. There is uh, possibilities to to grow from and scale up from the procurement, but it needs innovative thinking of of the services and processes on the public sector side. And there, I think private sector can also help a lot. It should help. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, Okay, so there are maybe a few more uh, questions in, in the chat there. Maybe, Bia, if you have any yeah. time, you could take a look and answer. Uh, but we have to move forward. So it's actually break time now. And we are on a break until 2 o'clock uh, Eastern European time, Helsinki time. Uh, and it's 1 o'clock uh, CET. So after the break, we will have... Uh, stage one, stage two, and some workshops and roundtables. So make sure that you pick the right topic for you. And thank you, Pia, and thank you, everybody in the audience, for such a great chat. See you after the break. Go check out the sponsor booths and take some coffee and come back. See you. Bye.